All right, um, then let's try to find the common ground first um, in few issues before we go more into deeper your experience and businesses. Is uh, I think we need to define the topic a little bit better because uh, in my uh, most likely the understanding among the audience here about uh, CSR or sustainability or sustainable business models, it's, it's quite different. And in Estonia, uh, what I felt, there are kind of two paths that I don't really want to go there today. And I just wanted to tell you so that we don't get struck into these issues is that one is that quite often when we talk about sustainable business models, we start talking only about environmental issues. So. Uh, I mean, yes, uh, we do know that uh, the, the climate has uh, warmed one Celsius since the Industrial Revolution, and now the P Paris Agreement is trying to make sure it doesn't go to two. So we agree there. So my question, and actually a request to all of us, is that let's not only be stuck in environmental issues. That's one thing. And another thing that is like, for me, it's like very Estonian related thinking is that. Um, uh, a lot of businessmen in Estonia and people tend to think that when we talk about uh, corporate um, responsibility, then that means donating money. That corporate responsibility means donating money or giving money to the charity, and that's it. I mean, during the past year, I've had several situations then when I realized that that's what they get. But CSR is so much more. So let's try to make it wider. Okay, so now I give a word to Kati, and can you please tell us more what you do at Finnair and why do you do and how Finnair has changed over the years so that now they actually need a person like you. And that's your everyday job there, to take care of the sustainable business model. Well, I, I think we had the same involvement uh, as you were talking about, the starting with the environment first. But as, as fin, Finns are engineers by heart, I guess, we started with the, uh, with the environmental issues on the technical department, starting already 1987. That was environmental policy organization led by the uh, technicians, led by engineers in the uh, technical department. We were measuring noise. We were making taking steps to reduce noise. We were taking steps to reduce solvents used or the chemicals used or, or things like that. So it was really fact-based things, measuring everything, reporting everything, and, and, and very technical. Then it evolved to be uh, reporting outside as well. So we started reporting on the environmental issues 1996. And then, of course, at the same time, we were doing lots of good things on the social side, but we didn't realize that this is part of the sustainability. So sustainability agenda was mainly about the environment. And uh, then when I was hired, I, I had been with the company for a long time already. We also saw the stakeholder pressure coming from outside. So we needed to react more and in the kind of having a larger front for the sustainability and then and since 2008 we've been reporting for instance for the uh, for the human rights as well and then different things but I, I have to tell even though this is going to be a, a long speech now but I'm telling the story that when I when we started reporting on these issues the idea uh, uh, along this global reporting initiative KPIs and then frameworks I went around the company and asked like about some some things about the human rights and anti-corruption and anti-bribery things that you have to report on that and I got the message that but Kati we are a Finnish company we don't have these issues and I was like well we cannot really write that down that we are a Finnish company even though we operate in the kind of a global market and it's not a thing but now it has evolved, actually, that I take benefit that, yes, we are a Finnish company, and by law already, or by uh, legislation already, and then by the Nordic nature or the, uh, the uh, Northern European nature, some things are more natural for us. If I go um, to these meetings with my colleagues from the other airlines, I can freely talk about the equality issues or non-discrimination, human rights. Not all of them can. And that is because we are the Finnish company, and, and this is already 
taken care partly by legislation, but of course we as a company have to do more. But so so it has evolved, and on also if. Like you said that at, at at the beginning the companies were only making money. I think it has gone like this probably that at the beginning there is this factory or or something in the middle of the uh, village, and that owner was taking or was it then a big farm taking care of all all the people around the area as well, building schools and things like that. Then it became an issue only making money and you don't care about how much you pollute or whatever you do and how the society is doing. It was making money. And now again, we are there where we also want to contribute to the societies where we operate. So I think there has been involvement in the companies, but also in the societies in that sense. Can you can you say from uh, from the business you have today that investing into sustainability is actually profitable? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> <laughs> no that, yeah, so. I, I, well, I think we all should do that and we must do that and eventually it will be also profitable for us uh, at the aviation it's quite there's uh, for the environmental issues it's quite easy math one kilogram of fuel is 3.1 kilo uh, 3.15 kilos of co2 fuel being the biggest uh, this uh, the uh, the uh, biggest cost item for us and and the uh, emissions from that fuel being the big biggest environmental uh, impact that we have so of course we have the every incentive to trying to save on fuel and then save the environment as well. But on the social side, we need to probably make more investments. And then we really have to look for, for our supply chain, maybe pay more for our suppliers. And that's costing us more. So, and so far, the customers are not willing to pay more. But I'm believing that they will, and the company believes that. And I, I think when we invest on these things, we also invest in the future. And that's the only way how we can operate in the future. That's the license to operate. That's the license to grow. Otherwise, we will be out of business. So even though it doesn't pay off today or next quarter or ne next financial year, it will be doing that in the future. And there are already customers who care. Good. Maria, you want to reflect on that because you know... Yeah, I'm a customer who cares. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I'd rather use an airline uh, which takes the environmental and social responsibility issues seriously than use Ryanair, for example. Uh, so I think it pays off in a way. And I think also there is a huge risk in not taking these issues seriously. Because it means that you will always be on the edge of sort of getting a media scandal in, on your hands. Or you will, uh, maybe there will be some new legislation and you will be very stressed about it. Because you're always just doing exactly what you're forced to do. If I buy a product and I read on this product it says, usually says something like, we take care of the environment. And then when you read the text, it says, we follow all environmental legislation. And then when I read it, I read, we don't do anything more than we are forced to do by law. And then I think that this company will be very stressed for with every political decision, be it on the national level, on the regional level, on the EU level, or international level, they be, will be so stressed every time there is new environmental legislation because they are living on the edge all the time. And I think that is expensive also, not to be prepared for what will happen. And if you look in towards the future and you see these uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, for example, they say that 2030, we should reach these uh, sustainable development goals. And it concerns everything. It's not just climate change or save the oceans. Uh, it's gender equality. It's the right to education. It's lots of, lots of things that you should take care of. And if you believe at all in politicians, they will do some things to at least show that they are trying to reach these goals, which means sharper legislation, uh, sharper demands, uh, sharper demands on public procurement, for example. Uh, and that means that all those companies who are living on this edge all the time, they, they will have problems. I'm quite sure about that. So do you believe 
to, into those politicians you just mentioned? Well, yeah, I do. I do believe in politicians. Uh, in a way, I do. I mean, uh, there are, of course, ups and downs in politics, and there are good and bad politicians, as there are good and bad business people. But I think if, if you agree on the international level that you should all work towards the sustainable development goals, uh, there will be a pressure, not only from other politicians around the world, but also from people. Because, I mean, we all want this planet to survive. We want people to, to uh, get a possibility to live healthy lives and so on in the whole world, not only here, but in other parts of the world as, as well. So in the long run, yeah, I believe in, in politicians and I believe in humans. For I mean, we are the only species that are actually have the possibility to see the consequences of what we do here and now and see the consequences that might be on the other side of the earth or you know, like a couple of decades into the future. And if we do not take this responsibility, no other species on this planet will do it for us. And there are no aliens. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to reflect on this politician's um, side that uh, two years ago I was at Almedal and, and I was listening to you. Uh, I can't remember what was the discussion. I didn't know you back then so well. But from time to time when I listen to these discussions, I tend to take notes. And I save them to my uh, phone. I have them on iCloud. And when I was preparing this debate for today, oh, no. I just remember that, oh, I must have something somewhere about Maria. And, um, and I, I just opened it. And um, so two years, two years ago, on uh, June 2nd, you said, we cannot afford to have politicians who are afraid of the change. Yeah, we can't. Do you afford, approve this message? Yes, I do. I do, and I, and we can't afford to have business people who don't approve of change either. So, but the, I mean, you get the politicians you deserve because you choose them. So, I guess uh, that's that's. Uh, do you, you, you you need to to of course also get people engaged in these issues. That's the question. Do Swedish people, do people in Sweden, do they follow the change? Do they, or are they afraid? as well, because it's so human and so normal to be afraid of the change. I think, I think we are all afraid of change. And if, but, but the problem is if the politicians and the business people are also afraid of change, because then we will not have anyone to put our trust in. And that, that's uh, when we get more afraid. And that's when nothing happens. But I don't think Estonians are afraid. You've seen so much change in Estonia in the last three decades. So you, are we can, you, can, you cannot be scared of change. I don't believe you if you say you are. So let's ask, are we scared? Is, the, is there any Estonian here who's scared of change? Hands up. OK. <laughs> you were right. Nobody's scared. That's good. OK, but coming back to the profitability, uh, let's uh, talk with Raul a little bit. I know your company has made huge investments into machinery and into R&D to make sure that what you do is will affect uh, environment on, mi on minimum. And you have taken a lot of risks. You have invested so much money. Is it coming back? Has it come back? Or do you believe that it will? Um, I'm quite positive about that because uh, through our long history and experience also, uh, I have to say that I left Estonia on this day when Estonia got Estonian crown, not Euro, but crown in June 1992, on the same evening when I collect my first 300 euros in the changing point, I left Estonia through with, uh, with a ship to uh, Stockholm. It was my first trip, and since then I have been totally in Sweden about three and a half years in different periods in total, not constantly. So I'm a little bit sweet also, so I, I have friends there, many friends there, and I see the difference in societies actually, and this is the problem. So Swedes are so much ahead from us, this is clear, and uh, that is not, I don't see moments or change right now to, to catch them uh, back uh, so far, in, uh, especially in uh, environmental questions and issues with companies. It, it, um, it is touched to the environment, it is touched also society, 
And uh, yeah, we have so much to learn from Sweden, Denmark, Finland also. We have good partners in France. This is amazing what they do. And actually, through this experience, we have done this uh, development and, and create um, our system, our, our concept, we call it. We call it Arena concept. And this is uh, well known today, so well known that even in FIFA head office in Zurich, we are considered as one of two uh, plastic and uh, second-hand, um, uh, let's say, synthetic turf uh, recycling system in the world. So I'm quite positive. And uh, but it, it, yeah, it took only 26 years to to create something, and now we can um, earn money also from that because today, uh, about 12 months ago, 13 months ago, I hired first sales guy in our office. Uh, really, last 12 years we have had zero salesmen in our office. So we sell all the projects through our experience, through example works, through our good partners, good words about us. And even today, when we got one, two orders every morning, so then we don't push with that. So we just present our environmental um, way, sustainable way on that um, industry. Uh, this is unique. And I see that, uh, yes, we can earn those millions back, um, what we spend for R&D. Um, this is a funny situation in our company. This is, uh, I am the main owner of, of our company, but I'm not the CEO. So I don't run this company last five years. Basically, what I do, I run R&D division and uh, do a lot of travels, uh, do a lot of, uh, last year, for example, I had 111 uh, takeoffs by the plane. Uh, with last year, it will be less this year, but it was crazy last year. And it means that um, I can do this uh, development and, and I see also statistics and I see our customers. And for example, uh, since last year we worked basically in Scandinavia, a little bit in, in UK also. I have been in UK for two years. Uh, but now today, actually today we work with two teams in uh, Spain and one team in uh, Greenland and other eight teams between there, somewhere in Belgium, everywhere in Scandinavia. Uh, so we, are, we have fields in 26 different countries in the world. And yes, I can answer this is a profitable business can be done if you, yeah, if you can influence the, the business and, uh, and a little bit rule the trends. So you must have you must be proud to, to change the trend, for example. It takes years, yes, but it is possible. That's a, a relief to hear that it is possible. But when you said at the beginning, uh, when we were doing the introduction round, you said that when you started, you actually didn't really know what you were doing. And you, you just didn't know it. It has evolved in time. So today, have you actually framed uh, what is the purpose? Why do you do it? What, do you want to have like that kids would have uh, better playgrounds or football fields? Is Have you explained it for yourself, to yourself today? Uh, of course. This is, um, this is about me. Uh, this is about how I think because um, if uh, we named that uh, cowboy capitalism, what is the standard way, let's say 95% maybe of businesses uh, are run by, by that um, idea, then uh, I'm happy to be this 5% just uh, to run uh, our other side in the water. So uh, maybe somebody will follow also. So, but uh, totally in, in our business, globally, in, uh, in sport business and in football business, we have network which is very strong. So basically, I know equally the same business uh, in 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 many countries, and this is one network. So it's easy for us. Sports it means always it's different. There are no there are no so much bad habits, and and um, uh, in our network people act a little bit differently than usually. So yeah, blame us, but we are like that. So so then in short. Why? You do it because you care, or yeah, uh, because I can. Oh, because you can. That's but good. but I, can I ask him a question? So you were there in 1992, thinking that I need something to do, and 
and then you decided to make synthetic football fields. Isn't that a quite complicated thing to just start doing like that? Why not like plastic cups or something easier? Uh, if, if this is your line, then you do that. Uh, it was very simple for us. I went to building exhibition in um, Mariestad in middle of Sweden, middle of nowhere, actually, and we didn't know what to do. I was just on the first, I was finishing first uh, year in my university, and I was like on a vacation and a little working trip in Sweden and, and visiting just one, uh, one um, exhibition place. Uh, it was just the moment. I step in, I saw their business, I saw their um, technology, what they had, and I got immediately ideas how to develop that. I did offers, and the next day we did agreement. So we were representative for this company in Estonia for the next 10 years. And also we did offer developments for them. So our technology was a lot of used in, in Sweden also. So it is cooperation between, um, it is network basically. And if you are involved to these people, then you just in, and that's it. I don't know how to, how to explain. But what I'm saying that cowboy capitalism is easy way for everybody. Just read the business book. Uh, read about these words that uh, you need profit, you need turnover, you need cash flow. All this is true, but you can do all this the same uh, also through environmental perspective. And, and uh, this is fun, actually. If you feel that you can do that and you have this power, then this is fun. I'm starting to love our audience already because we have one question. So, Erke, can you take the microphone there? Hi, thanks. I'd like to make an argument. I think you're kind of confusing the issue when you're saying that profits are here and value and purpose is here, but they're somehow different things. Because profit seeking, uh, saying, as you said, that the primary purpose of a company is to make a profit, that's a value statement. And it isn't so that this has been the case throughout history. That that's just what companies do. And now we're trying to go from profit seeking to values or something else. This, there's been a debate in the 20th century where Milton Friedman was, in, even in the 70s, quite radically saying that the only moral thing for a company to do is to create shareholder value. And then uh, on the other hand, we had uh, Peter Drucker, one of the greatest management thinkers of that century, saying no, the only purpose of a company is to create a customer. Uh, and so the question isn't that either profit versus values or what kind of value and for whom. Are we creating value for shareholders through profits or value for our customer? by delighting them somehow else. So if you accept the position that profits come first, then you're kind of, I think, fighting an uphill battle. You, if you put profit on the same even uh, playing field against all other values, it becomes much easier to say that, hey, maybe we're being stupid by only going for one, one value instead of many others that we could go for. Thanks. Well, thanks for that. I, I'm just going to take uh, your note uh, to Kati and ask, uh, to whom you are creating values? Who are the shareholders, customers, who? Finnish people, Finnish society, you are the Finnish company. Well, I think we should uh, create value for the, all the societies where we operate. That's as simple as that. It's not only, and, and as you said, the profit is not, profit seems to be only money, but value is more. Value is also like, if, if, if the purpose of our company it hasn't been defined in, in kind of a one sentence, but if I think it from my viewpoint, the purpose of, of our is like enhancing the connections of the people and, and societies and businesses, enhancing understanding of people uh, of towards different cultures or even kind of enhancing peace in that sense, but also creating value for the society to have opportunities to connect with other people or connect businesses. So, and then and, and you need, of course, profits to do that in order to operate. So I, I wouldn't say that profit is the bad word only. You need profits and, and then, but it depends how you, how you kind of share that profit then, where do you put that profit? 
if you only make money at the same time you are like destroying the nature only and then not caring about that at all then it's a bad thing but if you make profit you make people your workforce or societies to feel better and then you also try to minimize the environmental impact or things like that then then there is a value more value than just making money that's my see, yeah i can see maria yeah wants to take no it from here. yeah i just think that i mean if you look like 100 years or 200 years back in time when people started companies it was usually that they they had the money to invest in some new technology that could produce something that was valuable for the society in one way or another uh, and uh, uh, i don't think they had only profit in their minds when they did that they thought that we will produce this good product and we will sell it and it will it's something that people need and therefore they will pay us so even if, if of course in the end they got profit from it those who survived it wasn't their only purpose when they started. Uh, then we went into to the last, um, uh, uh, well, the 20th century. And then in the end of the 20th century, when we had this uh, globalization, then we could see that there were so many companies who were working on a global level who were not connected to the societies at all where they had their businesses. And they had a tendency for quite a many decades to don't give a shit about the, the consequences of their businesses because they were creating value for their shareholders. Uh, and then they, after having met with some quite strong protests from people, well, both in the countries where they operated and uh, civil society people in Europe and in the US and so on, they started to, to think that maybe this is not the way of doing business in the long run. And then companies like Unilever, who were one of those who were quite criticized a couple of decades ago, started to change their mindset again, trying to connect to the local societies where they operate, the people who produce their raw materials that they use to make the food and so on. And they started to make a business out of being more responsible than their competitors. So it sort of moved like up and down. And I think we are heading towards a, a time when sustainability will be really important for people. And also when we make service and ask people today, especially young people, it's both in Estonia and it's in Finland and it's in Sweden. You can see it in all three countries that they are very concerned about sustainability, uh, both social sustainability and and environmental sustainability. So I think there is a business opportunity for those companies who can see that these are actually something that makes your products worth more. Take me back to Katy. Yeah, actually, now I have two things on my mind after Maria spoke. So go on. But the first thing is that also when you said about the new generation and, and people, I think if you are acting in a sustainable way, you are all always in a better position to hire the best people to work for you as well and then that is also profitable for you to make the idea to, to be able to hire because as especially younger generation they are very, really keen on having the similar values in the work life than the uh, the, uh, the uh, otherwise so so they want to share the same values with the workplace where they where they operate daily but the other thing that i was saying that there is a big debate now in, in Finland and it was in Sweden about the uh, taxation of emissions from aviation and then we've been telling that yes aviation fuel is not being taxed and the purpose for that actually was already from the after uh, second world war world war that the aviation fuel and the maritime fuel is not to be taxed because we needed connections and we needed to expand markets and we needed to to kind of change the world and create opportunities by that so actually coming back to that i, I think there is still the same purpose and same idea for these businesses to connecting businesses connecting people helping societies but yes then there is another question that yes we must pay for the emissions and and, and probably that has changed since that. Yes, uh, Raul first and then to the audience. Oh, you wanted to point it to him. Very good. Then uh, microphone, please. Um, I'm, 
I'm really interested by the discussion, uh, but um, one thing that I've been trying to avoid in recent months, well, since people pointed out it was happening, was being in a kind of a liberal bubble of everything's okay. And I feel like all of the uh, discussion is, should we say, slightly left of centre or maybe directly in the centre. And um, I'm, I'm so, so, some of the time I'm a school teacher and the school I teach in is in Tallinn. And um, we had a debate about universal basic income, which I know in Finland has been uh, has, has been a discussion over the last few years. And I was uh, I was showing videos. I was advocating for universal basic basic income, and I did the sort of Jerry Maguire thing of saying, "Right, who's with me? Who will uh, who um, who will be the proponent of universal basic income?" And there was unanim there was unanimity um, in the class against it. Um, even so, uh, we say that young people are becoming more socially active and are becoming more. Uh, um, more um, social justice orientated, but um, there seems to be um, a consensus still towards people should be able to do whatever they want and um, towards the individual, particularly within Estonia. The, the other thing that I would say is um, I, um, I, I wonder if that's reflected in our political discussion because, um, okay, I, I know the current government hasn't um, done things that everyone likes, but um, when it was coming in, when the Social Democrat uh, Centre Coalition was coming in, there was an awful lot of alarmism about, well, are we going to get socialism in Estonia now? Uh, when they abolish the flat wage income tax, is that going to be the end of Estonia as we know it? And I feel like we're still at that stage a lot of the time in Estonia, that the, the, the debate is still if we open the door a little, then we'll get full-on socialism. And I think until we become a bit more measured in our discussions on, you know, what is right and what is not, we won't get to the stage where we, we'd like to be in terms of social justice and sustainability. But I'd like to know what you guys think. All right. Who want to go first? Raul first, yeah. Yeah, I like your point. But... Um, I tried to explain this a little bit um, uh, around around the corner. Uh, for for the beginning, I will explain one uh, one definition. Uh, in Estonia, mostly uh, is used um, public procurement, like um, the main mainstream for to buy something for a community or local government. So basically, it means that 99% um, cases, the cheapest price will win the tender. And this is the public procurement standard today. It means that always uh, what you get is not the best what you get because you, you must choose the best one and there is no other options. And people don't know that already 2013 there is a European legi legislation uh, officially and um, what we use now more and more globally is, uh, and especially in Europe, is uh, GPP, which is uh, Green Public Procurement. Uh, so it turns it up down, up, upside down because you can name the percentage like 30% uh, value for the money or the cheapest price and 70% for the other, other values, uh, whatever it is. In different cases, it is always different what you can put to this 70%. And it, it will change the game tremendously because then you make the rules you, you you together with customer you can work out the basic uh, points and uh, playing through absolutely legal way you can turn the way uh, how things are both how they are used and through this I see that in our business at least in plastic industry this is um, the main mainstream right now what we what we try to create and there are a lot of um, supporters do this way. So, for example, uh, very often there are rules and legislation already existing, absolutely 100% already, but uh, there is no power to translate the rules and there is no even less power to take them to to everyday use, use. So if we as uh, entrepreneurs, we can, uh, or let's say private investors and private companies, we can help to find those um, uh, legal aspects and bring them out and, and uh, 
come with this conclusion to the customer and mostly 90% the customers are smart people they don't maybe they are lazy sometimes maybe they don't think so fast and they don't want better and they don't the most thing what governments do they don't like make mistakes they are afraid about that. No, nobody will not agree if they if they see a small risk on that. But uh, if, uh, uh, for example, even in Estonia, we have um, around more than sixty governments now, or local governments now, after the form last year, and we can see that um, maybe ten percent of uh, new local governments are very progressive. You can talk with them with everything. You can talk with them about uh, green public procurement. This is free, and then 50% of them say that no, this is too risky. We have uh, elections next year, and we can't take risk. And this is life. Basically, ignorance is what breaks us down and and slows our business and our our life down. So this is my personal opinion. Hey, Maria. Yeah, I mean, I, I could discuss basic income with you probably for a long time, but I think we will avoid that right now and go to the uh, bigger question is, is everything okay? Uh, of course it's not okay. I mean, everything, if I gave the impression that I think that everything is okay and only moving in the right direction, it's not actually my true feelings. I wasn't trying to say, all I was trying to say was that... Uh, I feel like we're all endorsing each other's ideas because we all broadly agree on them, that's all. Yes, but I, I think actually we could disagree quite a lot if we really come to the concrete proposals. And that's what happens all the time when you want to sort of um, increase environmental taxes, one thing that Kati mentioned, I didn't. But I've been a politician, a green politician, trying to raise environmental taxes at several points. And if you ask business people in general, they are for environmental taxation. They say, that, yeah, it's quite a good way of decreasing emissions and everyone has to pay for their emissions and it will be also cheaper for those who are good and not emit so much and so on. But then if you come with a proposal and say, now we will raise exactly this environmental tax, there will be only complaints. They will complain about everything. And it's the same with environmental legislation. Every proposal for, for sharpening environmental legislations that we have put forward in Sweden, the business uh, organizations have opposed it. Every single one, every environmental tax before it was implemented. Afterwards, they boast about how good they are at environmental issues because they have changed because of the legislation that they didn't even want in the first place. And that's what happens all the time. And I've actually stopped listening to the business organizations when they oppose different kinds of proposals that come forward today. Because I know it's just that they are shouting, the wolf is coming, wolf is coming, wolf is coming all the time, and the wolf is even, isn't even there. And well, that's, that's how it is, that they say that they like uh, to, to sustainability, that they are very responsible and so on. But as soon as it's sort of proposal on the table, they will oppose it. But then you implement it and they will not take it away afterwards. They will just change and become a little bit better all the time. But I will also want to say that it's easy to say that Sweden is better than Estonia. Business people in Sweden are much more interested in sustainability. Yeah, it might be the case. But it's also the case that Swedes' environmental footprint is much larger than Estonia's environmental footprint. Because we have more money and since a longer time back and we consume so much. So we produce a lot of environmental footprint in other places in the world because of the things that we buy. So even if our also our young people when they say that they want to buy sustainable products and so on and they really appreciate if they can work for a company who takes sustainability issues seriously and so on they still want a new uh, iPhone at, at least every year so it's I mean it's there are good things there are bad things in the development today and of course we want to push it a little bit more to the to the good side in Estonia and in Sweden also so do you buy new iPhones to your kids every year I actually had my last iPhone for five and a half years until I accidentally flushed it down the toilet. <laughs> and then I had okay. to buy a new one. And now we'll yeah, keep that for at least five years. No, my, my kids cannot have a new one every year, no. Kati, is Finner afraid of those wolves that uh, Maria was talking about? So yeah, when it comes to the taxes, for instance, yeah, we do oppose taxes completely. Uh, not not uh, if it's a local tax, but I would 
recommend that we would have a global tax, probably not tax, but the other measure, global measure for the emissions, then I don't oppose. And I've been actually pushing that in the industry association, and I was taking out from that association for a while. There were a couple of us doing that, so so we were like kind of left out for a while. We were too radical, too green at that point, and now the whole industry is cheering for that proposal. So it, it evolves also, but yeah, for taxation, for the local tax in the global business, I don't believe in, but I believe in global measures, and then, as I said, and I can say it here as well, that I need that the, uh, the price of carbon for aviation for any business is too low. So we have to have a reasonable price for carbon for all the businesses, and that helps us to make wiser decisions as, as industries, as businesses, but also as governments. And until we have that, we keep on pushing emissions to the, uh, the uh, earth at the same rate. Uh, I do believe in the individuals, and I do believe that people are responsible, but like Maria said, that uh, on the other hand, yes, you can be a very environmentally conscious in this end, and then you buy your next iPhone, and then it's being shipped to you by the HL and the other uh, planes fly. <laughs> so yeah, we make, so we need governments, we need businesses, we need individuals, we need consumers to work together in order to, to get there and in order to really, really make uh, powerful decisions. No industry will do that on their own. We have a question from the audience. Christina? Uh, I have a question to Finner. Um, if we uh, take a look at the stakeholders, those that actually bring profit to you, those investors, your employees, your clients, which stakeholders of these are the most demanding of CSR? Which are the most sensitive, in your opinion? Probably our own people. We just made the survey. Uh, it's it's usually we have this materiality analysis as part of the reporting cycle, where we ask all our different stakeholders what really matters. And uh, yes, our corporate customers do say that this matter and then what do you do for environment and when they ask uh, the tender from us for their flying, they have the environmental and social sustainability questions there in place. But it only counts like this, the price always comes first. That's why I was a bit cynical at the beginning. But I'm happy that they still ask. They do ask. And if we are not able to answer them, they would go somewhere else because they are, that's their compliance program. But anyway, they do ask, but it's a minimal thing. Uh, investors, yes, they do ask more and more. And that's becoming more and more important driving force for all the companies, I think, when investors ask. But the most important thing for us so far has been the opinion of our own people. Because if they are not happy with the company, especially when it comes to the social sustainability, if they are not happy with the company, it shows. And it shows for our customers as well. So then that cycle is inevitably bad for the company. So so I think, and then I was so happy when we did the survey this spring, we asked our own people that, what do you value in your own life? What is important for you in your, like outside Finner in your in your life? What, is, what sustainability as, aspects are important? Their well, well-being, uh, child rights, human rights, recycling, emissions, all these came up. And then we also asked them that, what would you like Finner to do more? What would you like to, what are you able to do more in your own work or what would you like to do? So, so that gave us like 1,500 answers and more than 100 people want to come to an interview to tell more. And I think that's where the value comes also. And that's how it shows for the customers as well. I can have fancy reports or as a company, we can have fancy reports, we can have flat web pages, we can tell whatever about sustainability efforts, but if it doesn't show in in our customer service uh, the items or whenever the, uh, the, uh, the our people meet the customers, it doesn't matter. It doesn't come true. So so that's why I would say that they are the most valuable asset about the year. And they also represent society as well. Thank you. Any more questions at this point? Yes, over there. 
uh, today we were speaking quite a lot about uh, uh, environmental sustainability, but I have a question concerning social uh, sustainability. I have a question to Finne already. Uh, of course, every entrepreneur earns profit. What are your charity projects and uh, whom do you help in society? Because Fina is doing quite well and you are a wonderful company. So compliments from me because I've been working in travel trade for many, many years. and very good partner. What about charity? Thank you. First of all, I'm happy to work for Fina as well. Uh, we don't do charity. We do cooperation, so it always involves our own people, our customers, and the company, and of course then the, the purpose of that organization. For instance, we work with UNICEF, and uh, we have the Schools for Asia project, and uh, our, our passengers are able to donate FINNA plus points, and, and they are also able to donate money whenever they book the flight. And with that money, we help the schooling projects in Asia, which is an important market for us. So it profits us as all also to help those societies to develop. Maybe these people at some way, someday will work for us, or they will travel, or or so. So it's it's not that we are such a good company. It also profits us, and it helps us also to to kind of get into those societies. The other good thing or example for me is that uh, we work with the uh, pink ribbon which is the breast cancer uh, initiative. And um, most of, I was asked once that what Finner has to do with the, uh, the uh, Pink Ribbon or, or Breast Cancer Society, why would you work with them? Most of the people working for the company are women, working odd hours, working, uh, eating whenever possible, sleeping whenever possible because they are flying around the world. So it's very important for them to learn about how to uh, take care of themselves, how to eat well, how to sleep well, how to take care of, of, of the healthy life habits. So once a year when we have this uh, pink ribbon month, those people from the Cancer Society or other instances come to our office and educate our own people and how to search yourself, what to do, and then how to, to kind of live a healthy life. Then also uh, we are able to tell the story of, of and, and, and in our like different channels, telling the larger audience about their work. And when the passengers are able to donate the points, we can fly the uh, Cancer Society nurses around the Finland with those points. So actually there are so many different things and it's, so it's not charity, it's cooperation and it, it benefits all of us and hopefully society as well. We have quite many partners and, and, and they all have a story behind. It's just not like that we give money to this cause or that. Thank you for that. And this is a, a very good example of that the CSR has to actually be useful for you as well. It's not just charity. It, it has to somehow link to your business and, and, and so on. But uh, I, I want to take uh, this discussion uh, to a little bit uh, on another topic. Um, as a final, we have like 20 minutes left. And um, everything you just described costs actually money for the company. So you basically this is where you invest and uh, and uh, maria said earlier that uh, well swedes have so much more uh, money and and which is true you have so much more money than we here in estonia well basically in estonia we don't have any old money we started from big zero in the 90s so and and that has actually created the sentiment, at least what I feel in Estonia, that Estonian business owners or leaders tend to kind of have an opinion that our companies are too poor actually to invest into CSR. So what I want to discuss with you now is that does it actually has to, does it actually have to cost? Or where does it start? Because um, to me it's actually starts from the mindset and you can do a lot of things without actually spending a lot of money 
yeah, I think I think that is true. And and Swedish companies say too that they are too poor to invest in in CSR. So it's not only here. And I think it was even more the case in the '90s that Swedish companies said that they were too poor because then there was the recession and there was also lack of money at some at some point. But what they realized, I think, uh, in the in the end of the '90s, was that there were actually some issues where it went hand in hand: the saving money, saving the environment. For example, when it comes to energy efficiency, we used to have very, very low prices on electricity in Sweden. And companies didn't care about how much electricity they used. And then there were some examples shown in the newspapers. For example, that a Volvo factory in Sweden used twice as much electricity to produce a car as the same factory in the Netherlands. And then companies started to realize that they actually used much more ele electricity than necessary with quite small measures they could decrease the use of electricity and decrease the environmental footprint and at the same time save money. So those things are the easy ones. So if you can reduce the, the amount of raw material you use, I guess that's one reason for recycling also, that you can actually reuse the same raw materials in some industries better, in some industries not maybe as, as good as in others. And, and uh, uh, you can sell your waste products, for example, and you can get money from that instead of just paying for someone to take them as waste. These things are the easy ones. But, but if you think of profitability in a bit of a longer term, I think you can also make money by producing things where you incorporate sustainability in the quality concept. So you, when you see it as part of the quality of the product, that it's also sustain, sustainably produced. And if you have like uh, the clothes company H&M, that is a Swedish company, they have been criticized so much for paying so low wages in the countries where they produce their clothes. And their clothes are really, really cheap compared to many others. And that's because they don't pay people enough. And they've started to try to change that because it destroys their reputation. And in the long run, their reputation is all they have. And I mean, it worked in the 90s. You, you could have a bad reputation and still sell clothes. But the competition today and the competition 10 years ahead or 20 years ahead will be so much stronger than it is now because there are more companies starting all the time. And not only in, in the Western Europe, it will be in Asia and everywhere. So, uh, and I think also at some point you will run out of countries where you can use people like that in factories. So it's better to sort of make a good, uh, a good business out of being good instead of being forced to do good much later than everyone else and not earn any money at all from it. But quite often, uh uh, companies, or even with, on an individual level, people tend to change when there is a moment of crisis. So we don't actually open our eyes before, you know, something bad happens. So, uh, Maria, do you have any case from your previous uh, work in Sweden where you've actually seen that a company changes the attitude or their uh, business model after a crisis? Yeah, I think one good example is the building company Skanska. I guess they've built things here as yes, well. They yeah, uh, they had a huge environmental scandal in the 90s, building a tunnel in the west of Sweden. And it, uh, it turned out that the, some of the material they used were toxic and it came into the groundwater and it killed cows and made it impossible for people living in this area to use the water for quite a long time. And, and uh, also the tunnel became very, very expensive, which was a problem, of course, for the profitability as well. Uh, and it took like 15 years longer to build the tunnel than they expected. They changed their whole environmental policy and everything to do with environmental issues in their business after that. And they are now one of those companies that are considered one of the, the most environmentally responsible building companies because they had this scandal. And I actually believe that Volkswagen, after this diesel scandal that they were involved in, will uh, b become, if they survive, <laughs> they will become one of the, the uh, most more sustainable producers of cars because they were really hit really hard by this. So the risk is, of course, that you do not survive such a scandal. But if you do, it will usually change your mindset. But it's the hard way. You can do it an easier way and change yourself voluntarily. 
Raul, you said earlier you have built your company 26 years. So now let's take the Estonian reality. We have a lot of small and very small companies here. And when you have to tell them that they have to do like very responsible business now, and then after 25 years, they're going to get something. <laughs> How do you think they will react? Or what would be your message to them that, um, how do you start actually? Uh, I, I think that situation right now is quite cool actually. Uh, all this influence and all this network from from other world globally is quite good. Uh, world is open, everything is uh, available to get and if you start from the right position and uh, create first business plan and uh, business plan should be like uh, philosophically in the right way so you must drag out or take out all what is what could affect you on the future in some um, in some bad way for example in in our case we know customers who uh, ask about past about um, about uh, business plan about um, philosophy of company and if you are, have option 50 50 then uh, customer usually use uh, choose your company to do this job so it's extremely important not only to be green but also uh, really uh, be green in heart and 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 um, just two things maybe what I, I like to say more is that uh, in, in global there was research um, that in yeah globally we have about 500 green label systems in the world today it means that uh, or actually the question is what why so many green label systems and mostly they are like um, PR projects so basically you 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 should be they, who give out next green label system they think that they will be better in some way but how to measure and how to be sure that this is the truth actually basically if you have much money then you just make big advertisement in the newspaper and and you can name it the green label system and green green labeling but is it the product or service also green so the measure is at the issue and what we did, we have done uh, we started a few years ago our our own company LCA program and um, I'm sure that it gives about 90% answers to all environmental and not only environmental but also social um, sustainability answers to that LCA it means that uh, life cycle assessment and it could be about product or about service both way so all your spendings or your cost or your emissions or your footprints will be um, marked uh, LCA is not created inside the company for the LCA you order institute or company in Europe there is about 15 of such institu institutes and then you order for not small money but quite quite huge amount you must spend for that and then you will get something what you can evaluate you, you can take it like valuation for your lca mostly it shows what is the co2 in your service or, or product but uh, there are many other options also co2 is not always the, the only thing what you can evaluate on lca and what i recommend uh, if you have no next three forty fifty thousand euros to do full lca if you start a company right now in estonia or anywhere in the uh, in the world just start from lca in your head and in your heart if you're on the wrong way don't do it if you feel that this is correct start it and then after 25 years maybe maybe you will be happy again 25 years kati has finer uh, developed like in an easy way or hard way and when i say this i mean have you had crises that have made you have forced you to change have you made changes because something went really wrong well as an airline you have crises all the time so yeah kind of <laughs> can you bring I, I, some I examples there hasn't there haven't been one crisis or two two crises or, or anything that has changed the whole thing but i think the kind of uh, what maria mentioned earlier the 
understanding of risks not being sustainable is growing. And uh, I think none of the companies who want to succeed in the future can afford to be non-sustainable or non-responsible. That's the only way. If you want to be a smart business, you have to work in a more corporate, uh, in more responsible way or, or sustainable way. And, and for us, for instance, at one point, we had lots and lots of difficulties with our own people. And uh, there were co constant strikes. Now, when we have invested more in well-being of our own people, non-discrimination, equality, things like that, it pays off, really. And then, yeah, well, cop, 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 you never know, but still, that's the thing. And, and then also, when it comes, like Maria said about the, I think the environmental manager should be the best friend of the, uh, the uh, financial manager or the uh, CFO. Because if you are saving, you are just doing smart business. It's not like the uh, rocket science. If you are saving on energy, if you are saving on your materials, if you are saving on your transportation, if you are saving any of these, you are saving money. And that's smart business. And um, also when it comes to the supply chain, the risks can lie in the smallest things. And then I've been using the example that when we have the tray in front of you, and uh, then we are all, all always talking about the kind of a supply chain in a se sense that what is the most important thing for us is that the fuel is delivered, the service is delivered. Yes, that's important, and that's in everybody, in top of the everybody's mind. But what about the little toothpick there on your tray that all the customers probably use? Do we know it, where it comes from? If it if it, if it would come out that it's done by the child labor somewhere in Asia, that would be a huge disaster for the whole company. All the customers have been probably using it. All our own people have been serving it to you. That would be a disaster. But that's the smallest item that sometimes you just buy, okay, as a bulk. You don't, so we have to pay attention to the smallest, smallest items as well, because those can be the most riskiest. And this is something that I learned also from our, the, the, um, the uh, chair of the board of directors. He comes from the uh, Stura Enzo who had this case. And so he learned it and it, it helped me and the company Finner also a lot to pay attention to the smallest details as well. So don't, the kind of, a, the, you cannot afford to be non-sustainable. Devil is in details. Maria? Yeah, yeah. I, I, sometimes I say to, to uh, management people in, in companies uh, that their surveys have shown that uh, those um, leading people in companies who have been forced to leave their posts in the last 10 years, it's much more common that it is due to ethical issues or, or something to do with lack of sustainability that have made them uh, have to leave their posts. So then they become a little bit nervous. That is very good because they see that there are risks if we don't take care of this. And I'm on the board of an architectural firm in Sweden. And, and we had a discussion once on the board level, should we go into Saudi Arabia? to make business. They had asked for, for an architectural firm to, to um, uh, draw a hospital for them. And they said one of the specialities of this architectural firm, shall we draw a hospital in Saudi Arabia with the risk of corruption, risk of inequality, risk of labor that's been bought from other countries and had their passports taken away from them, not being allowed to go home, maybe a hospital where they will not treat women equally as men and so on. And we decided that the risks are too big. Even if it was lots of money in this project, the risks are too big because the reputation is so important for these kinds of firms that, that you, you cannot risk that just to, to uh, earn some money. Uh, and I think that's, that's in the heads of more and more boards also, actually, that you, you, you don't want to take too much risks when it comes to sustainability. I just uh, remember a situation from Finland recently, uh, which is, I, I guess this is a value conflict, but it's, it's part of every company's CSR, what kind of values represents the leader of, of a company. I remember the new uh, manager of Pori Jazz Festival was basically fired the same day he took his job because he went to the media and said publicly that he thinks that uh, uh, 
uh, homosexualism is a disorder or a, a kind of a disease. So he, he was just fired immediately. There was no explanations expected. This is against our values, please go away. Uh, coming to that, uh, or just making a comment, we've been mainly here talking about the risks now, but also there are opportunities. So for instance, in this case, if you would have been open to everybody and our festival is open, if you, it could have been a business opportunity for you. And then um, maybe that's not the best case, but for us, for instance, the uh, we are now working a lot with the uh, different disability organizations or or looking at our product in a sense that how does it look from the uh if you have any type of disability if you have any type of if you are like well, if you are not able to sit or travel as as most of us are so what kind of a services can we offer and can we be better than other airlines can we kind of win hearts and minds of of these people because we some people said that okay there are only limited number of, of of this type of customers who need this help but what about the societies in in nordics especially in japan which is our big market people are getting older they need help in their travel at the same time we are going through a huge digitalization but not all the customers are able to do use those services what about if we at the same time when we design the new digital services we have this design for all concept we also design services that they are, they are able to use or all the people are able to use them and they are open for disabled people as well or older people or so on so there can be also business opportunities when you open up your mind and are not serving only certain type of customers or or so see the kind of a societal value and as a business opportunity as well let's open our minds question I have a question. Uh, when we talk about uh, sustainable business models and um, countries who invest in uh, environmental sustainability, mostly we talk about Nordic countries, countries maybe a little bit about in, in Western Europe. But when we look at the global market, um, how can we be assured that uh, we can sustain this is a sustainable uh, country model, business model? If we look at the Nordic countries, the uh, public uh, expenditures are going up, uh, public debts are increasing. How can we be assured that in 20, 10, 20, even 30 years we can sustain this system? Well, I, 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 uh, I hope I understood your question correctly um, because I, I think that um, Nordic companies or Nordic countries are not exactly maybe in the exact forefront when it comes to everything to do with sustainability. There is a quite a good competition from Southern Europe and West of the US and some other places as well. California is quite quite uh, way ahead of in some cases, but but still, I, I think we we must, we have sort of taught ourselves so good at sustainability for so long that there is a huge risk that someone else will take our place very soon if we don't keep the pace up. And, and that will be a missed opportunity for us, I'm quite sure, because sustainability issues will be more and more important in the world. And if we don't keep our, our place in this competition, we will, we will lose opportunities. And I think that especially countries like Sweden and Finland, actually, because we, we get more and more stuck with the systems that we once created, and it gets more and more difficult to change with time. It's the same with old companies, and we have lots of old companies. Old companies, they don't like to change so much. And I think Estonia, you might have like uh, three decades or something before you get stuck. So see to it that you run really fast now in the right direction. And you will be ahead of Sweden and Finland quite soon, I'm sure. Oh, thanks for that. Raul. Uh, I would say to your question that um, sustainable company consists of um, sustainable employees. Uh, and what is what does it mean is that um, um, if you if you try to imagine company where there is no working time, you don't need to come to the office eight or nine, or you have no control over your life, uh, and and your first benefit is not the money what you earn, but uh, let's say salary is your second or third. 
benefit uh, what you get from the company and then ask the question will you stay in this company so if you turn it upside down and again uh, look this company um, in different perspective then then it is easier to understand is it is this company sustainable are you staying there for money or for uh, for some relations or what uh, what is your main main um, reason in, in the life to do so basically work is um, not work what we do our company company is just a form or a tool what uh, what helps you to create if what you what you like to achieve in the life if you can put them together so your 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 imagination and your dreams and your company and your hobby on the same bullet then it can be quite quite strong and sustainable at the same time I kind of feel now that I want to come work for you. <laughs> Can I? <laughs> okay, yes. You have a comment? Yeah, I have a follow up. Uh, so basically, we put our beliefs in the values that people in the future will value the sustainability more. But when we look at the recent, uh, recent, how to say, developments in all over the world, we see that we can't even agree with the climate change and, and we can't uh, make any agreements and how the future will be any different. But I think uh, on one hand, it is true. On the other hand, um, people in the whole world today are much more engaged in environment than they ever were before so so i think international agreements are very very difficult always i think there is has been one successful international agreement on environmental issues ever and that's the um, ocean de ozone depleting substances the montreal protocol which uh, sort of forbid countries to use ozone depleting substances. It was quite uh, effectful, but uh, otherwise it's, it's uh, been impossible to make any such agreement. So we cannot trust in those anyway. What we need is technological development and also national responsibilities and business responsibilities. And even if we had the international agreements, we would still need the same to be able to, to change. So it doesn't matter that much. Of course, it's a big, strong signal if you can get an international agreement, a strong international agreement. But it would be the same kind of work necessary to do the real job as it is today. And I, I have hope also for the United States, even with Trump, because I see what's happening in California. And of course, it's a fight between different parts of the US. But if they can show that these technologies work and that they are actually efficient like putting solar panels on all the roofs in California, for example. Of course it will spread. If it doesn't spread in the US immediately, it will spread to Europe at least. And then it will spread somewhere else. And then we have lots of countries in Africa, for example. We have, have several countries in, in Africa where they have implemented legislations to promote clean energy, for example. So it's, it's not only Western Europe anymore either. So I have good hope for the world. More or less. I, I actually hope that we will manage this discussion without mentioning Trump. I know you ruined it. Sorry, I'm really sorry. But he, yeah, well, I just said I don't care about him. All right. He will be gone. So uh, let's make a, a conclusion round. And uh, I, I will just put up one question that I want to have a short answer from you. So let's imagine a situation that you are sitting in your company's or whatever company's boardroom and uh, there is a shareholder in front of you who is a hardcore cowboy capitalist. He wants more profits, he focuses only on fun financial uh, information and you have to turn his or her, her head that you have to take a little bit off from that profit because you need to invest into better future. So what will be the argument to do that? Who wants to go first? Well, I can go, it's easy for me. Luckily, I have no such situation possible. So shareholders are sitting in my head, not in my table, around, ta around the table. Um, so um, this is the fight. If I fight it correctly in my head, then everything is fine. and. <laughs> And it's clear, no fight anymore after that, to just direct 
uh, yeah, direction and just move out every day and step by step change the world. But what arguments do you use to yourself? Microphone. <laughs> what are the arguments you use inside your head to convince your other self? Uh, for or, me... Uh, or don't you have another self? Maybe? Uh, yeah, I don't like boring, boring situations, so yeah, my... Uh, just to make it more fun. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> okay. Kati? Well, um, I think the only argument for our industry especially is that this is the only way. It's the only way to, to, to have that license to grow, to license to go operate, to, to be smart in your decisions and take sustainability into account. We cannot afford anymore to not to do that. We, yeah. That's the only army. I, I don't, I don't, luckily I don't have to use that anymore. <laughs> so, so people have understanding and it's in front of our face every day. It's front of our fa all, all of us around this summer, for instance, we see what's happening in this world. So it's been actually, I think, quite good advocate for the, uh, and then in our case, for instance, if there is a climate change issue, if climate change is getting worse, we are out of business because it's harder to operate to any uh, certain destinations. There are more uh, uh, very extreme weather conditions, for instance. It costs us more. The certain areas become um, impossible to, to travel anymore, so tourism will shift. And then people and consumers, I have a lot of trust on us as well, that we make smart decisions. So, yeah, a bit more than one sentence. Maria. One sentence. I'm a Swede. It doesn't work for me, you know. Um, yeah, I'll give you three. Thanks. Um, I met this guy who was a CEO of an oil company once, and I asked him why did they invest in biofuels? What were his arguments for that? And he answered me by starting to say that, well, you know, you cannot put all your eggs in the same basket. You must have different options. You don't know what the future will look like and so on. Like he was arguing for with himself for why he did that. But then he became quiet and then he said, and of course, it's also this, the thing that I have grandchildren and I want to be able to look them into the eyes and tell them what I, what I work with. And I think actually that was his strongest argument, for real. That he wanted to be part of creating a world for his grandchildren. And I think it works on cowboy capitalists. Because I think he was before he had grandchildren at least. Thank you for that. So let's make a better world. Let's leave a better world for our kids. And as Raul said at the very beginning, uh, why you do it? You said, because I can. So let's just do it. Thank you. I think we've had a wonderful audience, by the way. Yes. Do you agree? I agree. They were, they were very sweet. So they actually had their two seconds <laughs> where they were actually thinking. I think they were better than sweets because yeah, they were thinking better. before they were asking yeah. questions. And, and also they, they, uh, they answered very intelligent, asked very intelligent questions and they raised their hands. Which, which is, of course, very polite way of doing it. Thank you. You can applaud to yourselves for being such a nice audience. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. I mean, you all traveled here, so thanks for taking the time.